Welcome back to the GCN Racing News Show. Coming up this week, in light of Jonas Vinegar admitting missing an anti-doping test, should we be more suspicious of his achievements? No, I don't think so, and I'll let you know why I think that. We've also got a win for Peter Sagan, plus I'll be looking back at another thrilling weekend of cyclocross action and round up all the latest transfer and contract news. This week in the world of racing, we learned that it was Recon Week. Wout van Aert and Jumbo Visma were busy re-familiarising themselves with the Tour of Flanders route in Belgium, whilst Laurence de Plus and Tom Pidcock were in France checking out the gravel stage of next year's Tour de France. Uh, great to see de Plus incidentally back on his bike after a long period of rehab from that crash at the Vuelta Espana. We also learned that you never know how deep mud is. Rider going down uh, heavy on the side. Oh, it's the same as well. It's uh, you can see how big uh, that rut is becoming there. Just taking a while, taking a minute just to get up. That's uh, Marta Bartels um, of Hess. That section caught a lot of people out on Saturday, but thankfully it was a soft landing. And finally, we learned that Jonas Vinegar missed an anti-doping test back in 2019, something he admitted for the first time publicly in a recent interview of Danish newspaper Extra Bladet. Uh, Vinegar says that the anti-doping testers came to his door, but his doorbell wasn't working and he wasn't near his mobile phone whilst they were trying to call. Cue hundreds of online comments saying Vinegar is guilty of doping. But does a missed test make you guilty? Of course not. Before I go any further, I should probably give a brief explanation of how the testing system works. So the out of competition testing is done by WADA, the World Anti-Doping Agency. Uh, riders then use a system called ADAMS, which is the Anti-Doping Administration and Management System. A rider on that system has to provide a one hour time slot per day and an address in which they can be found during that one hour time slot. Uh, that has to be done 365 days per year or 366 if it's a leap year. Now the testers can arrive at that address at any time of the day, but the only time that a rider has to be there is during the one hour time slot. And whilst I never missed an out of competition test myself, I did once have a call from the testers who were at my address whilst I wasn't there. However, as it was outside the one hour window I specified, it meant I didn't get a strike. For Vinegar's missed test, he would have got a strike. You are allowed three in a 12 month period before you're given a ban. And since that one happened in 2019, he would have since gotten a clean slate. Uh, the reason for the three and out rule is it's quite easy to accidentally miss a test. You have to give your time slots and addresses four months at a time. And since it's almost impossible to know your training camp and race hotel addresses so far in advance, or indeed whether you're going to be at home or not, you typically just put your home address and then update it as and when you can. Uh, something that could have caught me at once was when I went to my parents' house for dinner and I ended up staying overnight without planning it. I only realised in the morning that I'd forgotten to update the address my one hour window. Had the testers turned up to my own address that day, which is what I specified on Adams, that would have been one strike against me. Uh, that's just one example, but I've used it to illustrate how easy it can be to accidentally miss a test through forgetfulness or just a lack of attention and care with admin. And that is precisely why it is a three strikes and you're out rule rather than just one. These things can happen and so we shouldn't look at a single missed test being an indication of guilt. And it's a reminder of how rigorous the testing is for a pro cyclist because along with the out of competition random testing there is, obviously, in competition testing too. Generally, the GC leader and stage winner will be tested immediately after the stage, but there will also be a list of random controls for other riders, regardless of where they finish on the day or where they lie in the overall classification. And that is on top of the random controls that can take place at the team hotels on the morning of any stage. So, whilst I am not claiming that there is zero doping or zero cheating going on in the current pro peloton, none of us can know that, I'm saying that we shouldn't assume guilt simply because a rider missed an out of competition test. Although your opinion may differ. If so, you can let me know in the comment section just down below. On to a more light-hearted subject now, the B-King Criterion from Monaco, a country that has been home to Peter Sagan during his time as a pro cyclist, and so it seemed apt that he took his final win as a World Tour rider there yesterday. He out-sprinted Tadej Pogacar, who seemed to have forgotten to take his saddlebag off and his rain jacket out of his pocket. Maybe he was heading on for some extra training afterwards. Anyway, we got to see the trademark Sagan wheelie one more time at least. 
On to some actual racing now, and I'll start with the biggest cyclocross race from the weekend, which was the UCI World Cup in Dublin yesterday. Initial course inspections had shown it to be a little less muddy than last year, but when the rain came down just as the elite races were started, that soon changed. In the absence of Fem van Empel, Céline del Carmen Alvarado was looking to extend her lead even further in the overall standings. At the start of the day, she was 55 points in front of van Empel, who chose not to race the last three rounds. Uh, Lucinda Brandt, who's only ridden the last three rounds, was the other big favourite on the start line, and it wasn't long before the two of them found themselves clear of everybody else. So Backstedt and Marie Schreiber had initially been able to stay with the pace, but a bike change caused the gap to open up early on. It became clear shortly after that that Alvarado was not going to be able to stick with the brand, who really looked back to her best shape at the weekend. In the end, she'd crossed the line almost 40 seconds clear of the World Cup leader, with Backstedt just seven seconds further adrift. Uh, the Brit had been locked into a race-long battle with Schreiber, but she managed to hold the Luxembourg champion off to take her second World Cup podium of the season. And she's also now up to second in the overall standings. Uh, 63 points behind Alvarado, but seven in front of Lucinda Brandt. Inga van der Heide and Leona Benfeldt also leapfrogged Van Empel into fourth and fifth places respectively. In the men's, it looked like Thibaut Nace was on for another big win. Uh, he clearly had more power than anybody on the opening couple of laps, particularly on the hardest sections of the course. However, as he started to pay for those early efforts, his teammate Pim Ronha took advantage, attacking off the front of a five-man group and putting Elizabeth on the back foot, as he had been from the start of the race, pretty much. Uh, he did eventually reel Ronha back in, though, and we had a trio out front with a lap to go, as Lauren Swake also latched on despite a puncture. And it was one of the best final laps of racing that we've had so far this season. Ronha forged ahead again, only for Swake to claw him back with just a few hundred metres remaining. Despite his best efforts, though, he could not shake Ron Haar in those final few hundred metres, and he was no match for the Dutchman in the sprint to the line. And so, Ron Haar becomes the first male rider to have won more than one round of the World Cup this season. Few would have put money on that before the start of it. Uh, the win moves him up to second in the overall standings, 19 points behind the ever-consistent Isabit. Former leader Lars van der Haar, who decided to skip this round, is now down to third, while Swake and Nice align fourth and fifth respectively. 24 hours previously, many of the protagonists from Dublin had been competing at the X20 Urban Cross in Kortrijk. I do love that course, I must admit. Always produced some excellent racing. Lars van der Haar set the early pace with Corne van Kessel for company, but with the power sales and bingo duo of Isabit and Van Torenhout behind them, it soon came back together. A van Kessel would later slip back, replaced in the quartet by Cameron Mason. Again, it was an enthralling final couple of laps to that race. Mason was the first to get distance, leaving van der Haar in the unenviable position of going up against two teammates. As they so often do, Isabit and Van Torenhout played off each other perfectly, with the European champion getting a lead. Most of it occurred to his teammates blocking behind him. It was a lead that had started to look unassailable on the final lap of the race, until this. Oh, oh Van Torenhout down! Oh, and he's taking a big whack on his shoulder. Oh, Isabit runs into the bike. Van der Haar delayed as well. Mason trying to carry the momentum. Oh, disaster for Michael Van Turnout, who's gone down really heavy on the shoulder. Really nasty crash there for Van Turenhout, which left him down and out uh, with an injured shoulder, but which left three other riders in with a shout of the win. He's a bit tried to pick up where his teammate left off, but then he crashed on an off camber section, allowing Mason and Van der Haar back in the game. He's a bit did what he does best though, and that is never giving up. He was on a mission on that final lap of the race, and that determination eventually paid off with a small gap opening up to those behind him. Just two seconds separated him from van der Haar at the finish line, but that's all that was needed for the win, uh, the 44th of his elite career so far. Another solid ride from Mason saw him take third on the day. In the women's, it looked for a fleeting moment as though Fem van Empel's unbeaten run might come to an end. She and Puck Peterson seemed so concerned about what each other were doing that Lucinda Brown was almost just allowed to open up a decent sized gap in front of them. The world champion, though, was soon back on term despite a crash, leaving Peter in her wake. For a while, Brandt and Van Empel were locked together, but Van Empel opened a gap towards the end of the fourth of six laps, and that basically was the end of that. By the finish, she'd carved out an advantage of almost half a minute over Brandt, with Peter over a minute back in third. And so, Van Empel remains unbeaten this cyclocross season. That was her eighth win from eight races so far. 
One other notable performance on the day came from Amy Perriman. Uh, many of you will have seen her on our channel this year, most recently trying to teach Connor Dunn some cyclocross skills. Not an easy job. Uh, anyway, 21st place in Cortric was a career best for Amy in a race of that level, so well done to her. Uh, the cyclocross action will continue this weekend with the fifth round of the Super Prestige Series from Bohm on Saturday, after which the riders and their entourage will have a 650km journey west to Flamanville in France, which hosts the sixth round of the UCI World Cup on Sunday. Uh, those of you still subscribed to GCN Plus will be able to watch Saturday's racing if you're anywhere except Belgium, whilst the World Cup is more geo-restricted. That's available to watch if you're in Europe, excluding Italy, Belgium, Denmark and Norway. Uh, meanwhile, our documentary this week is a nod to racing from the past. Uh, Paris-Brest Paris is now held once every four years. 7,000 riders take on the 1,200 kilometre route, with those looking to win it doing it all in one go without any sleep. Uh, we followed British amateur riders Jack Thurston and Amy Hudson as they tackle this challenge for the first time, along with veteran French rider Dominique Lamouillère, who's racing Paris-Brest Paris for the 13th time. Here's a sneak peek. Paris Brest Paris is a 1,200 kilometer bike ride. It's about 7,000 riders who converge on the chateau at Rambouillet. C'est un rendez-vous euh, tous les quatre ans. Pour moi, c'est pas une course, c'est une randonnée. Along the way, you have to pass through checkpoints. You'll have like little places, and you have to go and either get a stamp. It's quite old-fashioned, but I love that about it. Paris West Paris, c'est euh, le Graal euh, du cyclotourisme. Older than the Tour de France, it's older than Paris Roubaix. I said to my husband, that's my next challenge. Paris West Paris is a challenge against yourself. On a participé au premier Paris West Paris pour nous en 1975. Et là, tu te rends compte que tu vas prendre le départ d'une épreuve qui fait 1200 km, t'en as un minima pour deux nuits sans sommeil. Literally every pedal is hurting right now. Oh, I'm trying to ignore it, but it's not working. I will not not finish unless something really bad happens. Je prends le départ avec envie de finir dans les tout premiers. I don't know if I can physically keep sitting on this saddle. I was so drowsy, I couldn't hold the line. Yeah, I just need to sleep now. I think I was at the end of myself. That film will be out for all GCN Plus subscribers to watch from tomorrow, but don't forget, you've only got until the 17th of December to watch that and any of the others that are on there. A bit of transfer and contract news now. EF Education Easy Post have signed up Yuhi Todome, who spent the last two years with their development squad, which will fold at the end of this season. Uh, the 21-year-old is a former Japanese under-23 time trial champion, and his signing completes the team's roster for 2024. Sebastian Berick is moving away from Israel Premier Tech and on his way to Kaka Rural, a move that I'm quite surprised about, if I'm honest. I would have thought it would have made sense for both the rider and the team to stay together for another couple of years, given how well he seemed to be developing. Uh, maybe I'm doing a disservice to Kaka Rural there. Meanwhile, Amelia Farlin will spend her 18th pro season with Arkea B&B Hotels next year, having spent the last few years with FDJ Suez. Lidl Trek have extended the contract of Thibaut Nace, who will now remain with them until at least the end of 2026, while Sudal Quickstep have confirmed that Dries Devenines will not be leaving the team. He'll just be swapping clipping pedals with car pedals as he transitions to sports director. Uh, one rider at the other end of his career who they have signed is Frenchman Paul Magnier. The 19-year-old was competing with Trinity Racing this season, where he backed up the promise that he'd already shown as a junior. Annemiek van Vleuten is yet to confirm what she'll be doing in retirement, but something she's already done is raised a load of money for charity. Uh, she was obviously keen to declutter the attic, and she put all sorts of memorabilia from her career up for sale. Not the first time that she's done this, the fourth in fact, I think, but on this occasion she raised €18,000 for the Orlik Foundation, whose I Swim Along project helps children from lower income families to learn to swim. A couple of bits of race news now. Uh, the Tour of the Alps route was announced last week. 709 kilometres over five stages and in excess of 13,000 metres of climbing. I expect to see a fair few riders use it as their final tune-up for next year's Giro d'Italia. Stage 4 to Borgo Valsugana looks particularly brutal, with almost 4,000 metres of climbing in just 140 kilometres. Uh, and finally, the Saudi Tour is no longer. 
No, it hasn't been cancelled. It's just been renamed. Next year, it will be known as the Alula Tour. Right, that is all for now, but I'll see you at the same time in the same place next week.